Go ahead and start. Good morning. We're on Christian ethics, and I'm going to talk about political Christian ethics this morning. And uh, I don't know what lesson this is. This lesson three, part two, two, of two three, two, part two, yeah. part two of ethics, or part two. Of part two is Christian ethics, the second time. The second. All right, it's two by two. <laughs> it's like uh, animals going on the ark, you know. And so, uh, very good. But we'll be doing that. So the we'll, uh, trivia question is a little bit of government is before Esther became queen, who were the king and queen of Persia? It's pretty easy. Don't get fooled. It's not a tricky <coughs> question. It's in the Bible. So who, before Esther became queen, who were the king and queen of Persia? Her parents? Well. That's just a shot. Well, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> You know, Esther was not the daughter of a king and queen. Okay, she was the spouse of one. a king. Right, and she, what, what was her duty? Well, I mean, how was it that she became queen? Why was there an opening for the queen available? Her uncle. Uh, well, it was her uncle was Mordecai, was not the king, but her uncle Mordecai played a prominent role in the book of Esther. Oh, yeah. In fact, as the savior of the Jews at the time. Yes, Xerxes and Vashti. And I, so turn to Esther 1 real quickly. And there's another name for Xerxes, Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus is the Hebrew name, and Xerxes is the Persian name. So it's possible your Bible might say Ahasuerus. I would hazard a guess that it would say Xerxes, though, because that's the Persian name. So, um, but turn there to Esther 1 real quick. This is what happened. This is Esther 1 1. Oh, uh, let me get my little reading slide. Some days the gleam is more than other days, my eyes. Who knows? All right. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When they, those days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed gardens of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were at the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen, passed with cords of white linen and the purple material on silver rings and marble pillars. There are couches of gold and silver and the mosaic pavement of puffery, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man way he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes and Xerxes. And you may remember, of course, that Vashti was called to essentially perform before the other nobles. I won't read all of it because uh, of time. But then she was deposed and then the king uh, basically hosted a contest to see who could become the next queen. And Esther won that contest. And Mordecai's suggestion, and then ultimately it led to the phrase, you know, you may have been called for such a time as this to deliver the Jewish people. And the book of Esther is fascinating. It's one of my favorite books, just from a Hebrew literature standpoint, honestly. And so I'll just mention the middle of the book, which happens to have worked out to be the middle verse, the way it worked, um, although verses were added later, was that the very night that Haman had determined he should hang the Jews and build uh, the gallows to get rid of Mordecai, hang Mordecai specifically, that the noise of that kept King Xerxes awake so that he was brought the books of the history of the Jewish people and how Mordecai had actually delivered him before. So by the very building of the gallows to kill Mordecai, Mordecai was saved because the king couldn't sleep and the king read the story and the king wanted to honor Mordecai and the Jews were saved. And it's an incredible bit of literature. Uh, it's an incredible book. Just You should read through it again sometime and just see all the nuances of it. But all that say, with the trivia question, we also talk quite a bit about the government being overly expansive there. 
perhaps. He had 127 provinces, satraps for each. He had a 180 day banquet. Can you imagine a six month banquet? You know, I perhaps would run out of things to say there. I don't know. <laughs> but I think it, I think it is incredible to think about the access. And then after that, he threw seven more days of a banquet. And then, of course, he essentially ended up uh, violating the honor of Ashley by having her, ordering her to come perform before his officials, wives, and drunken state. And of interest, Esther actually probably is only queen for some handful of years, five or six years. And then it appears from history that Vashti became queen again because the child of Xerxes was by Vashti and, they, and that child was not born before Esther was queen. So, um, you know, it didn't all necessarily end bad for Vashti, but I think we are, as a people, turn over to Romans 12 first and then we'll be at Romans 13 primarily. <coughs> We are, as a people, as Christian people, I think, uh, rather prone to being feeling violated by the government. We, that we, at times, uh, find that our government should be a Christian nation government. I think we, uh, we misunderstand that sometimes. And I'll explain that myself a little further on that and see how our approach ethically can be that of being a citizen who is a Christian, who is thankful for our government, lives within those bounds as much as we can, and is uh, also one who can follow God's will in that process. And so you may have had a varied experience with different government issues. I can tell you I used to be more involved in political things than what I am now. I was an election judge for some time at locally and used to, I posted a couple of fundraising campaigns, stuff like that. And I've burned out on it because it's an ugly world in the world of politics, you know? So I think sometimes the most helpful thing for me is to refocus on what scripture says about that. Romans 12, let's look at, over at uh, Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Kind of an interesting, by definition, you almost have to be proud to figure out who lives in low position. That's a challenge for us sometimes. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Now, I went ahead and read 13.1 because, as I often mention, our tendency to divide up the Bible into chapter and verse is incredibly helpful for telling people go to Romans 13.1. It's incredibly challenging when we stop the context of a passage and start the next one because somebody threw a 13-1 on there. And I think it's important to take this in context with try to live at peace with everyone, and then he starts to tell us about what we do about governing authorities. So let me also mention, because I promised last week we'd talk a little bit, in doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. So let me look at, uh, reread this phrase. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, he will heap burning coals on his head. Anybody know what that means? No. Okay. Good answer. <laughs> the answer is no. That This is one of those phrases that, frankly, has been a little lost to cultural change. We don't talk about much. In the old world ways, and possibly during the time of the... Uh, the teachings of Paul here, although the verse goes back to, uh, let me make sure I'm quoting myself right, it goes back to, yeah, Proverbs, so it goes back to the time of Solomon, 
It was actually a relatively common thing that if you were in sorrow, you know, you've heard those phrases like laying in sackcloth and ashes. And so if you were repentant about what you did, you would go dress in sackcloth and, and lay in ashes to show that the old you was gone and the new you was ready to thrive. And so the idea of heaping burning coals on the head was actually to walk around with like literally a headpiece that had some coals on it that signified you are burning the past, you are placing ashes upon your head, and you are ready to live as a new person. Uh, and that sounds very similar to the way we live. We're called to live as new creatures after our death, burial, and resurrection in Christ and baptism. And so when he says, in doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head, it's not to say that if you, your enemy is hungry and you feed him, or if he's thirsty, you give him something to drink, that you're punishing him by putting coals on his head to burn his head. <laughs> that's what it sounds like, but that's not what it is. It is a uh, calling to repentance that by being kind, by taking food and drink to someone that you may perceive as your enemy, you hopefully can influence them to change in a way that is remorseful. Yeah, remorseful is exactly it. The whole idea of sackcloth and ashes or coals on the head is remorse and change. And it's not to say, oh, I proved to you how you're wrong. It is to say, I fed you and uh, watered you, essentially, gave you food and drink, in order to show that I love your soul. Yes? Sort of a modern day example of that is um, Trick, Kathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. Whenever, I don't remember who the man is, but somebody that called out and there was a problem with being closed on Sundays. Uh -huh. that he was, and it was in the news a lot whenever that happened. And, uh, and Mr. Kathy just reached out in kindness to him and had lots of conversation with him and, and all and it really was like keeping coals on his head. He was kind and, and, and Yep. And Very good. Yeah, she was saying. But, but that's a good example of uh, Yeah, an example of this would be like True Kathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, had a I guess an enemy who was accusing him of being closed on Sundays because they were. Well, yeah. no problem. Yeah. Yeah. That could be a problem. Yeah. So, and they, he treated it with giant, uh, with kindness and gentleness and eventually caused a force, they were brought, no force, I don't know why I said that, brought about a good relationship. The kind of like keeping coals. Yes? I think it also makes you feel better toward them. It makes you like them better even if they <coughs> yes. are not doing exactly right. Absolutely. So it makes you realize that your perceived enemy is a soul created by God. Would that be a fair yeah. summary of that? Yes. Oh, yeah. So when I was younger, we had this thing we called debate or discourse or discussion or uh, consideration of somebody else's views to discuss and determine where that person's viewpoint was so that we could then be at peace more with them because we understood that. So, and I think in politics, politics always go back and forth, back and forth. And in politics right now we're at an age of hatred and and i think shamey of the other side and uh i am shocked at some of the comments i hear about you know if you bring up a viewpoint you're basically beat down to oh that's just stupid and you know then you the other person moves on we used to discuss those things i believe we'll have to get back to a point where we discuss those things again but when we view this as Christians, I think it's a challenge that we feel like that we just know better than the other person. And maybe maybe in some ways we do. I hope we do. I hope we know what absolute truth is, what right and wrong is. I also think that that's not particularly the role of the government to help legislate that for us. I think our role is to teach what's right and wrong and help people come to an understanding. We want to feed them. We want to give them something to drink. We want to help them come to the point of a realization of repentance and change. And so if we look at that again, oh, sorry, verse 17, 
do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do, uh, be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as anyone depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, as mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, rather than revenge, in other words, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Now, I want to stop there for a second just to kind of help explain what I think is critical in this verse. And that is that we talk about submission to authorities, and we talk about authorities being in place because God has established them. Perhaps the words we miss there are everyone and no authority except that which God has established. So let's look at it again from that perspective. Everyone, every person, every individual, every created soul must submit himself to the governing authorities for there's no authority, none. There's not a lunatic out there in charge. There's not somebody you, you don't like. There's not somebody out there who maybe has committed a sin in their past and then ran for office. There's not somebody who maybe has dodged their taxes at some point or another. There's not maybe somebody who has said, uh, you know, they wouldn't vote for a bill and change their mind and voted for a bill. That but there is no authority except that which God has established. I tell you, because I think it's one of the clearest examples I can think of in our lifetimes, there was outright anger and judgment and hatred and whatever toward a prior president of ours, George H.W. Bush, who said, read my lips, no new taxes. From the pure world standpoint or the pure American standpoint, when he said that, and then by concession and discussion and, and uh, review with Congress, they raised taxes, many people said, he's a liar, he's an idiot, we hate him, we're not going to vote for him, and who we end up in office from this American standpoint, by Hillary Clinton, through Bill. And so, <laughs> but thinking about that, what positive change came about because of hatred of one phrase? And that's purely from the American standpoint. Now, second, what came about because God desired it to come about? The first was President Bush had won office previously, and the second is President Clinton won office. And we don't know all the spiritual aspects of that, all the background of that, all the issues, who's more free, more Christian because of that. And I think all those things play a role because everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. Let me go ahead before we read the rest of this. I want to talk a little bit about another maneuver that we make as Christians that I think is world base maybe is a fair way to put it and a little bit useless and that is the realm of boycotts you know we don't have any active boycotts that i know of right now but when i was a kid there's this huge push to boycott things when i was a younger adult there was a huger if that's a new word for us a bigger push to boycott things one of the most famous of which was against the home depot so let me just talk about that for a minute. And again, this is purely a political ploy. It was not a, a particularly Christian ploy, if you think about that, although it was perceived to be. And let's think about it. Who remembers the boycott on Home Depot? Anybody? Maybe I'm talking to the wrong group. Okay, the Home Depot, at some point in their past, I think this is about 1990 to about time President Clinton was elected, um, the Home Depot decided they would extend uh, medical benefits to same spouse partners, domestic partners, uh, to gay, lesbian uh, couples. And so there was a calling in churches to say, 
Well, we need we need to boycott Home Depot because they're extending medical benefits to uh, gay couples. At the time, there wasn't gay marriage because that that wasn't a political entity at that time. So, what ultimately, if any, does anybody remember that? Am mm -hmm. I the only one? Okay. No. So, after many years of boycotting, somehow it kind of just fizzled away. Why? It didn't matter to Home Depot. It, you know and yeah and so what if you look at your average Protestant congregation now versus 1992 let's say 30 years versus the let's say the share price at Home Depot now who's gone up and who's gone down and I only say that to, uh, because I well because it's true but the number of people who declare themselves Protestant Christian in America is down. Home Depot has grown. And, um, you know, it just was a misplaced part of the political equation. And I'll tell you why, in my opinion, is that I don't think anybody called to go shop at Lowe's instead of Home Depot. First of all, consider what Lowe's political side was which I don't know, because I never looked into it. And secondly, the whole issue was, if you have concerns about a same-sex couple, you should go teach them, talk to them, pray for them. It's not about take away the money from the corporation that wanted to extend medical benefits. That has nothing to do with righteousness. And that's where we get misplaced, I think, with government thinking is that we think if we vote for somebody, it's gonna be a more Christian neighborhood for us so that we can evangelize more. We'll bring in people because taxes will be lower or there'll be more action against Russia or there'll be, you know, a bill passed about, um, uh, you know, that maybe schools can have a session of prayer after the school day on their public grounds. None of that has anything to do with the one-on-one -on -one relationship of you to the government, of you to the person near you that needs Christ, or of you to Christ himself. And I hope I'm speaking clearly enough on that, but now let's read this section, thinking about how we deal with our role as an individual Christian right here, as opposed to the big picture of, oh, I love this party, I hate that party, I want this third party, I like the other two parties, or I want this person in office, not that one. Think about that as we read this. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror over those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of rash, wrath, wrath, excuse me, I slipped in the medical deal again. He is a God servant, the ancient agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. You must submit because it is the right thing to do. Not because they could come after you and take away your freedom, but because it's the right thing to do. This is also why you pay taxes. <clears throat> For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe him taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So, I'll stop there for a second. So, if we think about this whole passage about, let's say that we should realize the authorities are in charge for a reason. Uh, you know, we have a skewed image of that in America because we have a constitution and a prior declaration of independence that talk about godly terms. 
And we get, I think, a little confused thinking that America is a church and it was established for separation of church and state. That's never made a lot of sense to me because most people don't say America is a church, but, America, but people will say America is a Christian nation. I would suggest that a group of Christians together makes a church. And I think it's interesting that we have a little bit of a weird perspective on that because we vote for people. When we vote, do, is it because we are instruments of God's will in that? Or because we are bringing about the change we want for who's going to be in charge? I think I would suggest to you, I think it's because God wants the person who it ultimately is in charge to be that person. Now, I would say, I don't think God has this plotted out. I don't think that he has chosen the president in 2032. But I think that based on prayer, teaching, willfulness, willfulness of people and individuals and advisors and politics and other people around the world and whatever, I think he places the person in charge who's the one that he has a role for in that great scheme that he knows so much better than us. I have no idea why people like um, Muammar Gaddafi, Adolf Hitler, uh, Idi Amin, Inner Hamway, uh, the group not person, um, the IRA, any of those, I don't know why those exist and cause pain, terror, murder, death, uh, genocide, but I think that there's a plan in God's scheme that he knows and he understands. Oh, Satan. Well, I think Satan can do it, yeah. but does Satan put the authorities in charge? Yeah. No. I'm Satan battle. Yes, battle. spiritual battle, I do agree. Yeah. Spiritual battle is absolutely it. <laughs> and I think, you know, if you think back to, for instance, one of the worst occasions of the last 20 years for us, here in America was, of course, September 11th, 21 years, almost. The, um, what happened, though, right after September 11th was our, our National Senate and Congressmen got on the steps of the Capitol mm -hmm. and sang and prayed, and people went back to church. We had churches full of people for about four weeks, maybe five. And, you know, then people kind of got away from it again. But it's amazing how something that is a spiritual warfare issue can cause people to realize God's in charge. And I think, you know, for that reason, some people are in charge that we don't see the big picture of that. What if, yes, go ahead. Yeah. I just want to, a lot of people weren't in our class when I brought this up before, but it just gives me chills how God groomed two boys uh, one in the U.S., one in Russia. So Ronald Reagan uh, was raised a Christian, baptized in a river at the same about time. Gorbachev was baptized in a river in Russia. And then both came to the powers of their country and uh, they met uh, together in the private quarters of Gorbachev and to Reagan's surprise, there was a Bible on the table, they started having conversations, and then from that, led the sea to bring down the Berlin Wall. Together, they made that choice in private. And, you know, God's hand started, you know, 50, 60 years before they met. And mm -hmm. It's just... Um, it's an incredible story. Yeah, She's so. uh, mentioning, sorry, Reagan and Gorbachev, and now they both were baptized about the same time in their respective places on the earth and met together with the Bible in the room and ultimately declared tear down this wall and took down the Berlin Wall. And even just one more thing showing you God's hand with Reagan um, and Harding. Uh, George Benson was president at the time. He'd been a missionary in China mm -hmm. and he knew the evils and understood what communism was and they had this series of videos that they wanted to present to teach. And he called somebody in Hollywood and he said, we know most people out here are communists, whoever he was talking to. But he says, I know this young man that I think will do a good job for you. It's Ronald Reagan. And it's through that interaction with Hardy, he learned about communism. Interesting. I did not know that Reagan had a connection with Harding University. So, mm -hmm. interesting. 
um, that, you know, I think, I think there are innumerable stories of the working of God's hand through uh, plan and government and providence that we'll never hear because they're not necessarily on the international stage, but they can happen in your neighborhood because you will pray for a perceived enemy and you will <coughs> help them with eating and with uh, drink and you will ultimately heap those burning coals on their head by talking to them about Christ. And I think it is a microcosm level. I think if we wait for Reagan, although I, you know, I'm a supporter of the tearing down the wall, I don't know how much Reagan and Gorbachev tearing down that wall promoted Christianity. And I think it was an incredible world event, no doubt. And it probably led to many people living who would have died under the regime in place at the time. But I'm not really clear that that promoted Christianity. And I think the teaching of people about Christ will promote Christianity. And I think when we look at this again, let's look at, uh, let me read it through real quick and I'll tell you about my, uh, the rest of the story on uh, the boycott issue because I think it's easy. Actually, I won't read through it again in the answer time. You can read it later. Uh, I think it's very easy for us to decide to support someone who will be our proxy for a purpose in the world. Like, for instance, you know, on some scale or another, we support, say, for instance, uh, let's say we have a youth minister. That's a fair example, I think. We want our youth minister engaged with our youth, teach them about Christ, tell them the truth, use the Bible, use examples, be there for them, support them. All those roles are roles of the parent. And all those roles ultimately come from home. If they fit with the scheme in the bigger scale of hiring a minister to work with those people, that seems to work pretty well. If it is a, a situation where parents say, I don't even know how to teach my child about God, so I'm going to turn them over to the youth minister to do that, then that's going to ultimately probably not work as well and possibly fail. Although I think it's really God that calls people to it. But I think it's got to come from the person closest to that person to have the honor of teaching them about God. I don't think we can turn that over to a proxy. So when we talk about boycott, for instance, like I was saying, like if you were upset, and maybe nobody was because it wasn't very uh, recognizable, but about the Home Depot uh, uh, boycott because they had extended benefits to same-sex couples, our duty, as I mentioned, would be to teach those people that we feel like are living in a way that is apart from God's will. I'll show them the, on, the, the joy of God's will. I have the honor again to teach them about Christ and help them and help their soul in their new walk with God. And I always think about when I hear about boycott, because they come up occasionally. People say, oh, I'm not going back to this story because they, you know, they said something kind of bad to me. And the, I always think about, you know, what if, if you had the person who's checking you out who worked for Home Depot, let's say there had never been a boycott. Let's say Home Depot had come out and said, we believe what the scriptures teach. We want everybody to be a baptized soul for Christ. And we believe in grace and forgiveness, and we're running our business by Christian principles. So he said, hey, I'm going to go shop there every day, because I like it. <coughs> but the person that you check out, that they pay their seven twenty-five to per hour, let's say is a Satanist. Let's say he's an atheist. Let's say he's a, a homosexual atheist Satanist. Uh, who, who sacrifices dogs, and he lives next door to you, and you have a dog. And so you start worrying. You know, what I'm saying is on the big scale, we can say, oh, we want more Christian influence over your company, so we're not going to shop there. When the individual is the person who ultimately has the culpability, and you have the culpability to take the word of God to that person. And on the converse, let's say, during that era, Home Depot goes out of business and they have this nice checker who was working for $7.25 an hour, scrambling to get by to feed his family where he 
had adopted two kids from Ethiopia and they barely could feed them. And he read the Bible to them every night and they attend church seven days a week, not just two. And an incredible person, he loses his job because they go out of business because of the boycott. And I don't think we can pick and choose the way we want the influence to be the big picture for you if we're not willing to live that influence as day-to-day -day Christians. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to realize the individual is there. It doesn't matter what GM does with their employees in the scheme of things. It matters what you do with your neighbor in the scheme of things. So looking a little further, let's look at this first. I'm going to just re-mention the tax deal. What if, uh, verse 6, this is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them. If you owe them taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Um, what if President Bush, back when he had done the read my lips on the taxes and raise taxes. What if he had said, like Joseph being told not to divorce Mary and take baby Jesus to Egypt to avoid Herod and raise him as the proper son of the Holy Spirit and Mary that he is. What if he had said, well, you know, divorce is legal under our law. I can divorce her. I'll just do it. What if George Bush, I maybe mix that up there, uh, phraseology, sorry, what if President Bush had said, like Joseph in that dream, I, got, I had a dream from God and said, I better raise taxes because it's going to promote more freedom to uh, venture out uh, for churches, be able to publish Bibles in their uh, tax-protected environment so they don't pay taxes anyway, and it's going to further the kingdom of God if we raise taxes. Would people feel differently about that? Would history in America be different? You know, those are things, just, uh, they're obviously rhetorical questions. I'll tell you the answer later in private. But the, uh, <laughs> but it's, you know, I think it's interesting that that became a big deal to evangelical churches, Protestant churches. And maybe it was nothing except like, I, you know, I, I have a business and sometimes we have to make decisions that frankly our employees will never understand. We have to get rid of a contract for a little bit. We have to change out a shredding company. We have to buy Lysol from a different supplier. Who knows what? We had a deal, a big deal, where we were getting t-shirts for the company for the employees, and we had to change vendors, and unknown to the rest of us, because the one vendor didn't deliver them on time and still required payment, so we got rid of them. Unknown to the rest of us was that was a cousin of one of our employees. So guess who won that political battle? But, you know, the people who were picking on their poor cousin uh, were the bad guys in that. But sometimes you make decisions because you have to for the betterment of that entity. And I think it's interesting when he says you pay taxes because the authorities are God's servants who give their full-time governing. Give everything what you owe him. Give everyone, excuse me, what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. And if honor, then honor. I would suggest we maybe at times have fallen short on respect and honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Let me stop there for a second. I'm going to try to have a son on time, which means about 40 seconds. So we'll stop there for now. When we read that, does it say, let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuous debt to love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law? Or does it say, let no debt remain outstanding, love those you want to love, and be critical of the others, because you possibly, or you can fulfill the law that way. And I think it's interesting if you really think about that, love your fellow man. We always talk, <coughs> big lip service, of we love the sinner, but we hate the sin. I would suggest you think about this week, whether you love the sinner and hate the sin, or if you just flat out hate them. And I don't mean to be too brutal about that. <laughs> that maybe sounded a little harsh, possibly, 
But I tell you, I think that's what we slip into as people. I am shocked how much I hear about the politics of anything, you name it. You know, it, whether it's gay rights, whether it's abortion, whether it's vaccines for viruses, whether it's whether a virus exists, whether it's that person is a lifelong virologist or just an idiot, or, uh, you know, whether there's a real syndrome, a long COVID or not, whether there's, you know, you name it, go on and on. I hear definitive views that people know better than anybody else. I know so many brilliant people, it's shocking. And I think it, I think it, it, it behooves us to humbly just love our fellow person. And I think that is the way that we can present the will of God to them. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. I remember a few years ago, I, I live in the little hamlet of Parker, Texas. And I didn't even know we had the night court. And I got called for jury duty in Collin County on Monday morning, and I ended up with jury duty in Parker, Texas on Monday night, same day, the weird deal. But I went to the court, and it was a case where uh, two neighbors who had been neighbors for 38 years had begun to have a dispute about offense. And one of them decided he would go to his neighbor and say, I'm gonna kill you if you move that fence. And because there were no other witnesses, it was a Class C misdemeanor. But they asked for a court, uh, the, the lawyer for the guy who threatened death to his neighbor. Um, they asked for a court to solve that for them rather than a judge or rather than be ticketed because that's the only penalty. And so I wasn't selected course never been selected never will but the I think it's interesting though that after 38 years of living next to each other there was that much unity and I didn't get into you know I didn't stand up to are you a Christian because a Christian shouldn't do this I'm going to guess they probably go to local churches I think that's a reasonable guess based on appearances and the expectation of 10 years ago and I think it's just tragic that something could come down to threatening somebody over offense. And I think it's amazing how much more could be done if they said, you know, I've read in as much as it is possible, let's live in peace with one another. I'll stop there, we'll pick up there next week. Thank you for all the attention. I'm glad we're done exactly on time. Always good news. And thank you.